So we've got a React app up and running, which is great. But the problem, and granted it's not a big problem by any means, but still. The problem is that whenever we make a change to our code, for example, if we were to open up our app.js component and add some exclamation points, we have to physically refresh our browser in order to see the changes. And this is something we can fix pretty easily. Let's see how. So let's open up another terminal on our directory. I usually just leave webpack dev server running in the background. And we're gonna run npm install save dev react hot loader and hit enter. And once that installs, we're gonna open up app.js and add two little things. So first, at the top here, we're gonna say import hot from React Hot Loader. And then at the bottom, instead of just exporting our bare app component that we defined, we're gonna say export default hot, parentheses module, and then parentheses around app as well. And this will allow us to see any changes that we make to our app without hitting refresh in our browser. We'll see that in a second. First, in order to avoid having to remember and type out our webpack dev server command every time, let's define an npm script for it. To do that, just open up package.json, and right above our test script here, let's define a new script called dev, and then inside it we'll put our webpack dev server command. So we'll say npx webpack dev server dash dash mode, development, comma, don't forget the comma there. And now all we have to do to run our app is type npm run dev and hit enter, and it'll build and serve our app for us. And note also that we can make changes to our app now, and we'll see them show up immediately without refreshing. And one more thing to note here is that while we're running our Webpack server, there isn't a dist folder as we might expect. That's because what Webpack Dev Server does is holds this dist folder in memory and serves it, and then deletes it when we stop it. If we want to actually build our React app so that we can see the files, what we can do is open up our package.json file, and create another script in here called build, and then instead of running Webpack Dev Server, we can simply run Webpack. So npx webpack dash dash mode development. And don't forget a comma after that as well. So now we can run npm run build. And we see that our dist file with all of our transpiled code shows up right in here. But I'm going to delete that because we don't need that for now. Okay, so the first component that we're going to create for our app is the to-do list component. And this is going to be pretty straightforward. The first thing we're gonna do is inside our source directory, we're gonna create another folder, and we're gonna call it to-dos. And inside this folder, we're gonna create a file called todolist.js. And from here, our to-do list component is gonna be a pretty straightforward React component. We're just gonna say import React from React, and then define our component. We'll say const to-do list, equals, and then its only prop for now is going to be the to-dos that it's supposed to display. And what it's going to do is inside a div with the class name list wrapper, class name list wrapper, it's going to simply take the to-dos that it gets as a prop and say to-dos dot map, and for each to-do, it's going to display a to-do list item component. We'll create that in the next video. To-do list item. And the prop it's gonna pass is the to-do that we're mapping. To-do equals to-do. And finally, at the bottom of this file, we're gonna say export default to-do list. And up at the top, we're gonna say import to-do list item from dot slash to-do list item. And this file doesn't exist yet, but we're gonna create it really soon. And that's our component, plain and simple. The only other thing we're gonna do is create a CSS file for our to-do list. 
And since this isn't a web design course, I'm not going to do any styling here. If you want to style these components, feel free to do so, or just use the styling found in the exercise files. So now that we've implemented our to-do list component, the next thing we're going to do is implement this to-do list item component to display the individual to-dos. And in order to do that, we're going to go through pretty much the same flow that we followed to create our to-do list. We're going to create a new file inside this to-dos directory that we created. We'll call it to-do list item .js. And we'll create to-do list item .css as well. Although we're not going to do the actual styling in this video, you can look at the exercise files if you want to take the styling out of there. And for this component, we're going to say import React from React, just like we do with all our React components. And we're going to define our actual to do list item component. We'll say const to do list item equals, and then its only prop for now is going to be a single to do that it displays. And then for the JSX for this component, we're going to have a div with the class name to do item container. And inside here, we're simply going to display the to-do's text property. So we'll say to-do.text. And then we're going to display two buttons, one for marking a to-do is completed, and one for removing a to-do from our list completely. So we'll say button mark as completed, and button remove. And we're going to put these buttons inside their own div, just for styling purposes later on. And we'll give this div the class name buttons container. And we'll give this button the class name completed button and remove button. So for now, that's it for the internals of this component. It's nothing too exciting yet, and that's where our ecosystem tools will come in. So at the bottom, let's say export default to do list item. And that's it for now. Okay, so now that we have our to-do list, to-do list item, and new to-do form components created, there's just two more things that we have to do before we can run our app and see these new components in action. The first thing we have to do is open up our app.js component, and instead of displaying hello world here, we're going to display our to-do list that we created. So in order to do that, we just have to say import to-do list from dot slash to-dos slash to-do list, and then replace this with to-do list. And then we're going to open up our to-do list and add the new to-do form component at the top of that. So we're going to say import new to-do form from dot slash new to-do form and put that at the very top here. And in order to prevent our app from getting an error, we're going to have a default value for our to-dos prop here. And that should be all we need for now. If we run npm run dev and open up our app, we see that it's definitely displaying the new to-do form, but since we don't have any actual to-do items in our application, it isn't displaying anything for that yet. Oh, and if you're wondering why the app looks so fancy, that's because I added in the styling that you can find in the exercise files. So in order to just get a taste of what our app is going to look like, let's add an object to this default value here, and it'll have a text property, and it'll just say hello. And if we go back to our app now, we see that this is now displayed as a new to-do item using our to-do list item component that we created. And that's all we have to do for now. Obviously, these components aren't exactly functional yet, since we haven't hooked them up to anything. But throughout the coming chapters, we'll see how we can use the React ecosystem tools to bring this application to life. The first React ecosystem tool we're going to be looking at here is something called Redux. Now, before I give you the details about what Redux is and how it works, let's take a look at the problem that Redux aims to solve. This should do a good job of answering one of the most common questions that people tend to ask when they learn about Redux, which is, well, why should I use that? So the question that Redux aims to answer is an extremely common one, and that is, what's the best way for us to manage state in our application? This can often be one of the hardest things to figure out in React applications, since there are so many options, each with their own pros and cons. For example, we could take a rather extreme position and have one central state contained by the root component, and then have it pass down pieces of that state to all its children. But this is usually a pretty bad idea, since once our app reaches any kind of size, we'll have to deal with an immense amount of what's called props drilling. And that's when we have to pass props through a component that doesn't actually use them, 
but just passes it on to its children. Now, I've seen apps where there are many levels of props drilling. The root component passes props to a page component. The page component passes these props onto a section component. The section component passes those props onto a list component. And finally, that list component passes those same props down to a list item component. Now, not only is this ugly, but it can be very frustrating to troubleshoot since sometimes a developer can inadvertently break this prop chain by mistyping the name of one of the props or something like that, which leaves them wondering why some value in one of the child components is undefined. So it's clear that a single state contained by the root component is probably not the way to go. So what if we went all the way in the opposite direction and just had each component manage its own state? After all, this would avoid the problem of props drilling. But now we run into another problem. What if components that are far away from each other in the DOM need to share data, as they most likely will? For example, what if somewhere down in the component tree we have a button component, and we only want that button to be enabled if all the pieces of a form component somewhere else in the component tree are filled out? Well, really our only choice here would be to hoist the state all the way up to whatever parent component those two child components have in common. But this leads to a rather unpleasant situation where you're never quite sure where in the component tree to find the state for a given component. It could literally be in any of its parents depending on the needs of the rest of the other components of the app. So it's clear that the two choices that we just went through are much less than ideal. But what other options do we really have? Well, a pattern that would seem to solve both the problems we've seen so far, the problem of props drilling and the problem of how to properly share state, would be to have what's referred to as a global state, a single centralized state that all components have unrestricted access to. So there's no props drilling because components can just access whatever data they need directly. And there's no problem sharing state since by default, all components share the entire state in this situation. Now this might sound great in theory, but in practice it can be a nightmare. And here's why. There are no rules for how to actually interact with or access the state. So what you end up with in all but the most disciplined code bases is an application filled with these transient, hard to recreate bugs that occur because of inconsistencies in the state. Just trust me here, an unrestricted global state is generally not something you want. So then, with the exception of the lack of rules and the subsequent chaos when using a global state, having a global state does solve the other two problems we mentioned, sharing state and excessive props drilling. So what if we were to take this idea of global state and solve its main problem by adding some strict rules and organization to it? Well, in fact, that's exactly what Redux aims to do. And in a minute, we're going to take a look at just how it does this.